But when it comes to instruction and detail, Paul only really briefly talks about three of them. And those are the interpretation gifts. The tongues, the interpretation, and prophecy, or the vocal gifts, however you want to listen or classify them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in, verse, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul gives the explanation or talking about the different kinds of tongues. And just a heads up, I know we'll be reading a bunch of different passages, but if you want to throw your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're probably going to be spending some, quite a bit of time there today. But we're going to be talking about the gifts of tongues. And as I've already mentioned, it's in the group of, uh, if you remember, there's three different classifications of the gifts, or three breakdown categories that they're all divided into. The power gifts, the revelation gifts, and the interpretation gifts. The gift of tongues falls under the gift of interpretation. Now, why the tongue? Why tongues? Why would God use a gift of tongues? Because when we look at it, the tongue itself is extremely powerful. Would someone please find James chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, please? James 3, 1 through 6. Basically, they were boasting themselves that, well, 
and they were comparing it to the level of the flood. Well, if the floodwaters came this high, then we're going to go a little bit better. We're going to show God who's boss. And this is how deep he's going to flood the water, the earth. The next time, we'll be ready for it. And we're going to stand here and we're going to sit. Well, how did it all begin? It all began with a speech. God told them to depart, to scatter. And what did they do? Man gathered to themselves. And they said, let us build a tower to reach unto the heavens. Why did they want to build that tower? Because they wanted to show God, hey, guess what? We can outdo you. We can outshow you. You're going to flood the earth this high? Well, then we'll, we'll show you one better. We're not going anywhere. So man's tongue can get him in trouble. And no man can tame their own tongue. Mom, do you still have James or did you already close out? That's all right. But if we would read James chapter 3 and verse 8, we would read that the tongue is an unruly evil. And I might be getting that mixed up with another verse. Mom, do you just have that? Yes. Because I'm getting my, my tongue's getting me in trouble now. But the tongue can no man tame is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So the tongue is an untamable by no by any man and is full of deadly poison. We cannot tame our own tongue. And if we would be honest with ourselves, there's probably some point where we go back in our life where we lost our temper or something, and words flew out with us without us even thinking, and maybe we did one of these. Or we try and brush it off. But regardless, there was at least one point in our life probably where we lost control of our tongue. No man can tame his tongue. But there's only one individual in this entire universe that can tame the human tongue. And what does Mark chapter 16 and verse 17 state? Mark 16, 17. Mark 16, 17. So they, these signs shall follow them which believe. They shall cast out devils. But what did God say? They shall speak with new tongues. And we would flip over to the Pentecostal passage in Acts chapter 2 4. We don't have to do there. I'll go ahead and read it. But we're all familiar with Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, where the Bible says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and did speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we take notice here that. James stated that, that our tongue is an unruly evil. No man can tame it. There's only one person in this entire universe that can tame the tongue of man, and that is God himself. And on a side note, in case I forget later on, when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, God, the, per, one of the reasons and one of the purposes of the gifts of the Spirit is for God to give back to us something that we lost some time between... <laughs> creation, and the coming of Jesus Christ. And probably more particularly between the fall of man and Babel itself. Because when we look at the tongue, and no man can tame it but God, if we go back to Babel, why did God change their language at Babel? Why did God change man's language at Babel? Up to this time, they all spoke the exact same language. They all spoke English, right? Sister Beth, give me a hand up. No, we don't know what language they spoke, but we do know that they all spoke one language. So, what happened at Babel? Why did God confuse or change their language? So they couldn't communicate and continue building. So they couldn't communicate and keep building. Or if I back up and look at it through a specific answer, which you were right, Brother Tim, you were exactly right. So they could not communicate. And if we go back then, if back up before the tower, God gave them a commandment <coughs> to scatter, to go abroad. And they refused to do that. But when God confounded or confused or changed the language, and they could no longer communicate with each other, what did they do? Well, then they scattered. So God changed the language of man because of their, their disobedience at Babel to scatter them. But when God gave the gift of tongues at Pentecost, along with all the other gifts 
when the baptism of the Holy Ghost came down, it was to unite men. So we see God restoring something. Where once tongues was used to scatter men because of their disobedience, now because of their obedience, God is going to change their language or change their tongue or give them new tongues to bring them together. Because what is the purpose of tongues in the first place? What, the gift of tongues? Who's it for? The gift of tongues is not for the believer, but in 1 Corinthians 14, it states, it's for the unbeliever. That is the purpose of tongues. However, if there is no interpretation, then the tongues by itself is madness. Paul also wrote about that. So why is it for the unbeliever? To bring them into the fold. To show them what we have is the truth, and that is genuine. So, going back off by side note, in case I forgot about it later, tongues is a supernatural occurrence. It is a language that is completely unknown to the individual. If a person knows Spanish and they get up and they get act like they're giving a gift of tongues and they speak it in a known language, that's not the gift of tongues. Just like that individual, if they're speaking from the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and that person who knows Spanish all of a sudden starts speaking in Spanish, that's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost to them. The baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence is a tongue that is completely unknown to that individual. And it could be a language of men or of angels. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. And I'll go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Tongues, the evidence of tongues and praying in tongues is entirely different from the gift of tongues. And I just want to bring that out once again. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, the evidence of tongues, or when a person is praying in tongues or worshiping in tongues is entirely different than the gift of tongues. When we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the tongues there is for the person speaking it, is to edify them. The person who's praising or praying in tongues, that is the Holy Ghost praying through them to edify them. But the purpose of the gift of tongues is not to just edify the individual, which it does. I will not lie. When a person is used in the gift of tongues, to some degree, brother, you're like, it does edify them. But the purpose of the gift is to edify the body itself. And when it comes to the gift of tongues, that's where its counterpart, the interpretation of tongues, comes in. But, like I said, those tongues are entirely different. If we would go throughout the Bible, there are different types of tongues. If we go back to the book of Isaiah, we're not going to because I'm going off on a little bit of a rabbit trail. There's mention of other tongues. When we look at the passage there in Isaiah, what God is talking about, when his people has completely turned a deaf ear to him and will not hear his voice, Isaiah is saying he will send somebody in from the outside to deliver God's message to them. The new tongues is their heavenly language. The, that is evidence at the baptism or that is evidence during the praying or this uh, praising when the person is praising God or praying in tongues. But there is a tongue that is mentioned and meant for the edifying of the body itself. Now, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to be spending some time here for this point because we're going to begin talking about the operation of the gift itself. Now keep in mind, if I were to ask what chapters of the Bible deal with the gift of the Spirit, what chapters of the Bible instruct us and inform us about the gift of the Spirit, what would they be? Does anybody know? If we were to read about the gifts of the Spirit, in somewhat detail or a little bit more detail, where would we be looking in the Bible? Chapter 12 and also 14. 
But we cannot forget about chapter 13, brother. Chapter 13, the love chapter, as much as everybody loves to talk about love, 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 and 13 being the love chapter, we'll read it at weddings and so forth. Chapter 13 is actually talking about the gifts of the Spirit as well. Paul's still giving instruction from chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians. Paul is giving instruction on the gifts. He does not stop. Just because he's talking about love and he seems to quote gifts on love does not mean he's not talking about the gifts. He's making a point. If you speak in tongues and you give the gift of tongues, have the gift of tongues and interpretation and prophecy, and you do all this without love, then it's pointless, is what Paul's, I should say pointless, but it's just making a bunch of noise. Everything we need to do is, when it comes to the gift, we need to let God use us um, out of love. We can't let it go to our head or think any highly of ourselves. That's basically the gist of 13. Paul focuses that these gifts are not to make us think more highly of ourselves than we're supposed to, but rather we ought to do them like we do everything else in life. We ought to do it from the love of our hearts. So when we're talking about the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, if someone would please read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 4, and also verses 6 through 9. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, and 6 through 9. And these are all the verses. Verse 4, verses 6 through 9. Anybody have 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, edifies himself. But he that talks not, edifies himself. I would that ye all take his tongue, for glad that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesy. So here Paul is giving instruction, instruction on the gifts of the Spirit. And he tells us that the person who speaks in tongues edifies himself. So let me ask you, why does the person who speaks in tongues only edify himself at this point? I'll give you a hint. In the words of old brother McGeechee, who is no longer with us, speak English. He used to do that in, in class sometimes, and he didn't understand what you were saying, if I remember correctly. Or I've heard him. Uh, basically, the gist of it is, I don't know what you're saying, brother Eli. It's not edifying me because I don't know what you're saying. So the person who speaks in tongues edifies himself. Is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. But along with the gift of tongues comes the gift of interpretation. If Brother Eli just spoke in tongues, or let me back up, if Brother Eli was used in the gift of tongues, and that's all we had was the gift of tongues, you don't know what he's saying, I don't know what he's saying. And then if Bob comes along and she's being used in the gift of tongues, but there's still no interpretation, I still don't know what she's saying, so it's not edifying me. I don't know what they're saying. So the gift of tongues is, um, edifies the believer itself. However, this is where people come in for people. Paul said, I'd rather let you prophesy. So all of a sudden, the tongues is a minor gift. Nope, that is not the case at all. Because probably the person that's saying this might have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but they've never been used in the gifts of the Spirit because of the hardness of their own heart or because of their unwillingness. Because the Bible states that God gives to every man severally as he will. So if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, guess what? You have gifts. That is scripture. He gives to every man severally as he will. But just because, but that still does not make tongues a lesser gift as well in any way. And that is not what Paul is saying as well. It is extremely important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 10, the Bible states, There are, it, be, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without <coughs> significance. So there are many different voices in the world, but none of them are without significance. If tongues was a lesser gift, why did God give it in the first place? What is the purpose? Why didn't he just give prophecy? Tongues is not a lesser gift by far. 
In fact, I have heard occasions where tongues have been given without interpretation. Was the person himself the only one being edified? No. Because there does happen to be somebody in that congregation that knew exactly what that language was, knew what was being spoken, and God was dealing with that person's heart. Now, I will not deny that nine times out of ten, there is going to be interpretation. There really is. But there just might be that slight chance that there is somebody sitting in that congregation that understands that language perfectly and God is dealing with. So who is it for us to say that, well, there was no interpretation, so that person missed it? That's not our place at all. You don't know what God's been doing in somebody else's life through that. Like I said, nine times out of ten, and probably in the congregation we have here, there's going to be interpretation. Because I won't lie, I don't know any other language besides English. Sister Beth understands some French. But nine times out of ten, probably the only language really spoken in here is English, so there's going to be an interpretation. Nine times out of ten. But tongues is not a lesser gift. An interpretation, as I've already said, is normally vital for this gift to be understood. Normally. There are a few rare occasions. And the Bible does state that if there is no one there to interpret that the person who is used in the gifts of the Spirit or the gift of tongues should pray for the interpretation. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 13. And I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see where we go. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 13 states, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, we also need, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, we've got to realize people have been, mis have been abused in the past. The, the gifts have been misunderstood. I know Sister Gwen said that years and years and years ago, her mom, she was using the gift of tongues. That's what she was using. That was the gift she was using. I know I've redone it three different times in probably 30 seconds, but that's okay. Uh, but anyhow, she was at a service, and a tongues went forth from her mother. And the preacher who was in charge stopped the whole service and said, okay, everybody, we need to wait, because the Bible says that now that since she gave the tongues, she must interpret it. That's not scripture. That is not the word of God. If there is no one here to interpret it, should the person with tongues be praying? Absolutely. But at the same time, I think in the service, anyone who has the gift of the Holy Ghost, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in their life, if a tongue goes forth, forth should be willing to say, God, if you want to use me, use me as well. It's not all on that one individual. We have plenty of people in our churches that have the baptism of the Holy Ghost that all they do is they sit there with them. They get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's like he was the pinnacle, and now let's sit down. But they don't discover the gifts that God has for them. They're content to go in no farther. And that's where we sit. But once we get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we have gifts in our life, and it's up to us to pray and seek for God to say, what gift have you given me, and teach me how to use them. But, like I said, if no one's present, then that person should pray for the interpretation. Now, when it comes to being used in the gift of tongues, or any gift in general, there is a change that goes on. We know the presence of the Holy Ghost when we're praising Him in an unknown language. We know when the Holy Ghost, and I'm speaking to those, I should back up. The person who is praying in tongues, who is worshiping in tongues, it's the Holy Ghost <coughs> praying and praising through them. And we can sense Him in us. 
and around us when we pray and when we pray. But there comes a shift in our spirit when that same Holy Ghost that is praising God through us wants to change from talking to God to all of a sudden now he wants to talk to the congregation. I know Brother Eli, if you don't mind me, in times past, he said, you know that there is a difference when God wants to use you in the gift of tongues. You can sense it. There's a change that takes place. That change is because the Holy, as I've already said, the same Holy Ghost that is praising God through us no longer wants to talk to just God, but he wants to address those around us. So there is a change that takes place. And the same is, and I'm going to stop there. I know we have five minutes left. <laughs> We're halfway through the notes, a little over halfway through our notes. So, apparently I lied at the beginning. We're going to go a little bit farther. Next time we come together, we will finish discussing the, the gift of tongues. So we'll talk about that in two Sundays. But at this point, does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add concerning the gift of tongues? If not, just in recap, why do we have the gifts of the Spirit? Because God is giving back to us, the church, stuff that we've lost either in the garden or, I would say, even at battle. The gift of tongues is a change. The tongue is an unruly member. No man can tame it. You and I cannot tame our own tongue. Sometimes it gets away from us. There's, at battle, God changed man's tongue because they wanted to stay together. So he changed man's tongue to scatter. At Pentecost, God changed the believer's tongue to bring people together because it's for the unbeliever to bring them into the fold, to show them what we have is real. The gift of tongues is not a minor gift. It is just as important as all the other gifts. It is probably one of the most gifts that Paul gave us the most instruction on. We'll talk about this more next week, uh, in two weeks. And just because a, somebody is used in the gift of tongue and there is no interpretation, does that does not mean that that individual missed it. A, there may be somebody in the congregation that knows that language that God is dealing with then and there. And B, Perhaps there's somebody else in the congregation that somebody that God wanted to use in the gift of interpretation, but they missed it. And regardless, everybody who has a baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of tongues. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost gives to every man severally as he will. But the question is, what are we doing with that Holy Ghost? When was the last time we were used in any of the gifts of the Spirit? I realize some of the gifts of the Spirit are not all public display gifts. There are power gifts that maybe nobody knows about. The gift of faith, gift of healing, gifts of the working of miracles. You know, these might not be things that we always see in church. We don't know what goes on in individual lives. But regardless, for the person who has the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when was the last time that we allowed God to use us and any of the guests or revealed to us, God, do you have more for me? Are there any gifts of the Spirit in my life that I don't know about? Reveal them to me. Teach me how to use them. God, take me deeper in the gift that I already have. Teach me how to be more fluent in it, that I may be more effective for your kingdom. Because what is the purpose of the gifts? To build the church, to edify the church, to edify the believer. And with that being said, let's bow our heads and we'll prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you praise and glory because you alone are holy and you alone are worthy. Even right now, Lord, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. 
We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy would penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, make himself visible if he so chooses, Lord. I pray even right now, Lord, that you know the song leader and the musicians, Lord, give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Knowing the song leader and the musicians, Lord, give them the songs you have to sing, Lord, as they praise you upon high. Knowing the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today and anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your message that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives and even transform even farther into your image, Lord. We pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be clear, Lord, that um, you would renew a right spirit within each one of us, Lord, that we may not let the enemy use us to hinder the service, Lord, but, Lord, that you may have your way in every aspect, that the Father may be magnified and glorified in all that is said and done. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.